dog, go out on the prayer chain and everything. Ended up um, having her appendix removed. Defibrillator and leads are going to be removed because the coating is coming off of some. Infection clings to the metal parts. Then they will work to clear up the infection. After that, new equipment will be put in. So he is going to be moved to cardiac floor sometime today. Please pray for the weeks ahead. So we definitely need to be praying for Bill and for Mary as they um, go through that, um, that time. Um, so, yeah, definitely need some prayers there. Um, wanted to make an announcement for the ladies' seminar. There's a ladies' seminar coming up, and uh, uh, there's information in the bulletin there, and there is a sign-up sheet in the back. And if you have any questions about that, see Catherine or Tanya, and they can get you the right information. And uh, sounds like that'll be a great time for you ladies, so take advantage of that. Um, and then one last thing is... Um, as we go into today, um, as, as I announced last week, today, pastors all over um, Canada and the United States are going to be preaching, speaking on the same thing, on biblical sexuality and marriage. And uh, we're going to be doing that today, and um, many others are going to be doing the same. So be praying uh, for each of those churches and each of those communities where those churches are located because uh, we know the enemy is not going to be pleased. And uh, so he's going to certainly do everything he can to, to push back against that. But, uh, but praise God that there are faithful people around the world, around uh, the country, who are willing to stand up. So, um, yeah. So let's go ahead and, and dedicate this service to the Lord and uh, ask his hands to be upon it. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for just your many blessings to us, Father. We, we, we thank you that we're able to gather together as like-minded believers, Father, to, um, to stand uh, boldly and firmly on the truth of your word, to, um, to encourage one another, to uplift one another in, in the, uh, the needs of our day, Father, to be able to bring them to your throne of grace and uh, recognizing that you will meet each and every need. Father, we, we think of Abby, and, and Father, we thank you for the successful surgery. We just, uh, again, pray that you just continue to have your hand upon her, give her complete and uh, a, a full, speedy recovery. Father, we pray for Bill uh, and uh, Mary, uh, specifically for Bill, Father, that, again, your hand would be upon him. You would give the doctors wisdom and, and skills and abilities as they as they treat him and take care of the needs that he has. Father, we just pray that you would protect his, his health, strengthen him. Father, help uh, the, the surgeries to be successful and to help him to get back to full health, back to doing the things that you have for him to do and, and uh, be back with, with us here soon. Father, we, we just thank you for how you will answer that. Father, we uh, pray for the ladies seminar coming up. Father, I just pray uh, again that uh, you would just bring those ladies together, that it will be a, a great time of a refreshment for those ladies, Father, that they could uh, just be the women of God that you uh, have called for them to be in, in their families. Father, we, we think of the, um, the message that is going to be proclaimed in so many places uh, this morning, uh, all over um, the United States and Canada and, and probably other areas, Father, as we, we take a stand for biblical sexuality and marriage. And Father, we just pray that your uh, that your hand would be upon uh, each of those congregations, each of those men who speak. Father, that your spirit would just uh, 
uh, be there, Father, that your truth would be boldly proclaimed, Father, that you would just uh, uh, do a mighty work um, through uh, that proclamation that goes forth, Father. Father, again, we just uh, we give you thanks for how you will use all of that for your, your glory. Father, we, we pray as we go into the rest of this service that you would help us to focus on you as we sing songs of praise, that you would receive them as an act of worship. Father, as we give our tithes and our, our gifts of money, Father, that you would just uh, bless those. Father, that you'd receive them as an act of worship. Father, you would help us to be good stewards with that, uh, those finances. Father, uh, as we go into your word, that, uh, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us. Father, that you would be honored and glorified by, every, by everything that happens here. We thank you in advance in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Would you turn in your hymnals? We are going to sing page 728. Next, we are going to be singing page 727, Faith is the Victory.
And the next song we are going to sing is page 733. Once to every man and nation. The words of this ring so true for today's message, though it's a new one for me. Let's do verse 4. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy towards us. Father, this time we want to give our, 
our, some of our earthly treasures to you. Lord, take these things from cheerful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know that uh, that last song that we sang um, was probably new to many of you, and it was very new to me, and, and uh, maybe the melody was just a little bit hard, but I hope you took a moment to, to read and to contemplate those words. Um, Joanne is very right, I mean, and, and Tanya said it too, it, it, it speaks very much to our time. I'm just going to read the first verse, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, some great decision, offering each the bloom or blight, and the choice goes by forever, twits that darkness and that light. How true that is. I mean, every, I think, Every generation has had a time or a moment where they must make a choice and make a stand. And uh, each generation has a, an issue or something that they must, uh, they must deal with. And this happens to be one of ours. God's design for for sexuality and for for marriage. Um, It's definitely been under attack um, for for a while. As a a faithful minister of of God's Word, I feel I must make a couple statements as we begin today's message. I will admit that there will be some that may not agree with everything that I speak on today. I'm also aware of the the possibility that it may be misconstrued by some or may be labeled as being unloving, unkind, or narrow-minded. But I am of the conviction that God's Word is true and it, it is our final authority in all matters. I also believe that God hates all sin, all sin, not just certain sins that he loves people in spite of their sinfulness. And he has provided a way out of their sinful attitudes, their sinful behavior, through his son, Jesus Christ. According to Matthew 28, 19 through 20, and, and 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it is the responsibility of Christians and the church to boldly proclaim God's un changing truth, and to present Christ's light in this sinfully darkened world. And that part of this involves evangelism, getting people saved. And that's really the only real cure for sinful behavior. We need to be involved in politics and policies and 
all of those kind of things, we need to, to make a stand when our governments try to legislate things, but the only real cure to any of that is going to be evangelism, them coming to a saving grace of Jesus Christ. So this morning we're going to be kind of all over God's Word, but if I were to choose one verse to be kind of, one passage to be kind of our, our baseline, our starting point, it's going to be Ephesians 5.31. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians 5.31. There's going to be a lot of others. We're going to kind of move kind of quick, um, but if you look at your outline in there, um, you should have all the, the other scriptures laid out and, and uh, the outline gives the main verse for each point that we'll be hitting today. So Ephesians 5.31. Ephesians 5.31. God's Word says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So as I said earlier this morning, we're, we're joining with other faithful churches around the United States and Canada and, and probably many other places, even in the world. I just, as I shared with you last week, um, I shared with you uh, about the bill that was recently passed into law in Canada, Bill number C-4. And I want to share this with you again, just in case you missed it last week. And here's, here's an ex excerpt from the letter from Andrew uh, de Bartolo from the Encountered Church up in Canada, who wrote to this to John MacArthur. Bill C-4 passed through the House of the Senate without opposition. Not a single dissenting vote was cast by any member of the conservative party. It received royal assent on December 8th, which means it will come into law on January 8th, last week. The bill will amend the criminal code in Canada to ban conversion therapy. It will criminalize, among other things, causing another person to undergo conversion therapy, promoting or advertising conversion therapy. In the preamble of the bill, it says that the belief that heterosexuality, and I'm quoting, heterosexuality, cisgender, gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, or gender expressions is a myth. According to Canadian law, as of January 8, 2022, the belief in God's design for marriage and sexuality will now be seen as a myth. The bill defines conversion therapy as, quote, a practice, treatment, or service designed to change a person's sexual orienta orientation to heterosexual, to change a person's gender identity to cisgender, to change a person's gender expression so that it conforms to the sex assigned to the person at birth, to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, to repress a person's non-cisgender gender identity, or repress or reduce a person's gender expression that does not conform to the, so the sex assigned to the person at birth. The definition is intentionally broad, and it can clearly be used against any preacher or elder who speaks against homosexuality or transgenderism, or who counsels a person to obey Christ and abandon their homosexual or transgender actions and lifestyles. This means as of January 8, 2022, it will be against the law to preach, teach, or counsel regarding God's design for marriage and sexuality. I quote it, and this is a quote from the law again. 
Everyone who knowingly causes another person to undergo conversion therapy, including by providing conversion therapy to that other person, is guilty of an indictable offense and liable to imprisonment for a term of not more than five years. Similarly, it says, everyone who knowingly promotes or advertises conversion therapy is guilty of an indictable offense and is liable to imprisonment for a term of not more than two years. So that means even you recommend it to somebody. Two years. Pastor John MacArthur added this at the end of the letter. We are all well aware of the evil power and destructive influence of the homosexual and transgender ideology. Now, our government is bent on not only normalizing this perversion, but also legalizing it, and furthermore, criminalizing opposition to it. Now, I've shared with you before how quickly we are seeing things erode even here in the United States. In case case you don't think it can happen here, consider this. In 2012, California passed Senate Bill 1172, banning gay conversion. New York, New Jersey, and Nevada have similar laws. In doing this, the California government sought to prohibit any correction of an unbiblical view of sexual identity because, and it, I quote from the bill, it says, California has a compelling interest in protecting the well-being of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals. Now, I don't believe that we should go out and, and be harming them, but for the government to go against those who speak against it, and on August 18th, 2020, the Democratic Party declared at its nat- national convention that it would ban harmful conversion therapy practices, quote-unquote, whatever that means. The Obama administration appointed more than 250 LGBTQ plus people to serve in the government. The Biden administration has promised to increase that number. And so far, they have. Canada is just further ahead in this aggressive political priority than we are. But make no mistake, the push is on here too. And that's why we're joining in this united stand that will put the Canadian and the U.S. governments on notice. They have attacked the Word of God. Today, we are taking a stand on biblical sexual morality. Now, sexuality is no longer something talked about in hushed tones or even ignored in polite conversation. Likely, many of your conversations at work or at school, church, maybe even in your own home have touched on this in some way, especially if you've been talking about what's been in the news lately. We live in a sex-drenched culture. It's all around us, isn't it? All around us. And it is completely unhinged from God's Word. Rather than recognizing biblical principles regarding God's gift, God's gift of sexuality culture has distorted it. So we must, be, we must be equipped to confront false thinking. We must do it lovingly and truthfully. We must be directing people to the gospel. We must never be afraid to speak to the issues of our day, using God's word as our foundation. Today we will apply God's word to some of these major issues regarding sexuality, transgenderism, homosexuality, and marriage. These are issues that many individuals and families are struggling with. Possibly someone that you know. Maybe even you yourself. Or someone in your family. It doesn't seem like any family is not touched by this in some way. 
And it's vital that our thinking, our practical response be rooted in God's word, not in the thinking and the attitudes of our culture. The Bible, the Bible has much to say on this topic, much to say about this. There are many books, many studies that dig deep to all that God's Word has to say about this. And we could spend weeks and weeks in a series of sermon messages to unpack all of it. We're not going to do that today, at least not right now. And as I was thinking and, and praying on how to approach this today, there's just so many, so many ways you can go, just so, so many things that you could speak to, how you could speak to it. But I was led to present it in a, in a way that was practical, relatable. So we're not necessarily going to go into a deep theological study today. As I thought about the idea of God's design, God's design for sexuality, I made the connection to something that I know. Construction. That's, that's my day job. I mean, that's how I pay the bills. I'm a builder by trade. Most of you know that. And I saw how home construction illustrates God's design here. So that's going to be kind of the framework we're going to look at it today. We're going to look at how important it is to follow God's design. And what can happen when we don't. I broke this down into to six areas that I think are, are relatable and representative. You see them in your outline there. The architect, the foundation, the framing members, the finishes, the building inspectors, and then the CEO. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So first, the architect. Every project, for every project, there is an architect. The architect is the one that draws up the plans and the designs. I brought some from a job that I did. You can see a lot of pages there. I won't open them all up, but there's, there's a lot of stuff in there. Every job, every project, there are, there's an architect whose job it is to work through all of the details, think through every possibility, and then put it all down, put it all on paper, so everyone knows exactly what they need to do. In these plans, there are for the electrical systems. There is a complete design for the electrical system, including the elevation, how far up off the floor the outlet needs to be, when he runs his conduit, how high he needs to have his conduit, how far off from the wall to run that conduit back? Everything. HVAC, same thing. This size ductwork, it comes up here, it drops down there. That far, come off this wall, run that way. This size, plumbing, same thing. Every dimension, thoroughly thought through. Everything considered. Because if you don't, the electrician decides, well, I want to run mine right here. The plumber says, well, I'm going to run mine over this way. The HVAC guy says, well, I feel like running mine there. Well, see, there's going to be some problems, right? But every, every project, there's an architect who draws up the plans and the designs. They're making what it's going to look like. They're the ones that have all the insight and all the knowledge and all the code and all the requirements. What it needs to be safe, structurally sound. They have to be aware of so many things. Actually, they have to be aware of everything. They have to take everything into consideration. The design goes into everything. The foundation that will support it. The framing structure that will form it. The mechanicals that make it function. The finishes that make it desirable and, and recognizable. And they have to know how it all works together perfectly. Now, 
I'm a, I'm a pretty smart guy. I've been building for a long time. I know a lot about building, a lot. I know the ins and the outs. And I've done a lot of different kind of projects. That Those plans actually are for Culver's I did over in Chicago. And I've learned and I've experienced a lot about building and design. But I'm not an architect. I am not an architect. I can't do his job. Now, I may think I can. I may think I can. There have been times I've been tempted to second-guess him, try to make some infield changes to the design. But whenever I've done that without consulting the architect, it turns out not so good. There are usually unintended consequences of those changes. They conflict with something else that I either didn't know or, or I completely overlooked. I've learned over the years that it's best that if I just stay in my lane. There's only one architect when it comes to human sexuality. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one that has always been, the one that created it, God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, before, before time existed for us, there was nothing God created. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. There was nothing, and then God created it. The heavens and the earth, he planned it, he designed it. And everything else, time, space, Day, night, water, earth, sky, plants, fish, animals, and mankind. Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image. In verse 27, male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Equal in their dignity, but different in and their design and calling. The man and the women are then commissioned in verse 28 to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. See, God created humans. He created man and women as sexual beings. Genesis 1 communicates both the identity of male and female. And that this identity is oriented toward a, a procreative union meant to populate the earth. That was the purpose. That was the purpose God gave. Genesis 2 tells us that it was not good for man to be alone. A helper was needed. This helper is both similar and dissimilar. Similar in her humanity, yet dissimilar, different in her design. The man and the women and the woman are intended to form a complementary union. That is God, the architect's design. And he knows how it all works together because he designed it. He designed it. We should not second-guess his design. Why? The foundation. The foundation is our next point. Every building must have a good foundation, what it's, what it's built on. A weak or improper foundation can cause serious problems. They must bear the weight of everything else that is built on it. So it must be firm. It must be rock solid. Must be must be no give in that foundation. When you when you build a house, when you build a building, the foundation has to be firm. It must not be compromised. Otherwise, there will be settling cracks. 
If you, if you build on, on soils that's been disturbed, the footings can become undermined. Structural failures, eventually catastrophic collapse. The house will fall. If you're building a house, you have to have a firm foundation. The same is true for your life, the life of the church. As believers in Christ, the Bible, God's Word is our foundation. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Bible is our foundation because it is God-breathed. The architect wrote it. We believe the Bible is the Word of God and that every word written in it is from God. The Bible is our foundation because it is useful. It's not just a a book to study. We can actually use it to teach, to teach what is right, to rebuke what is not right, to correct in order to get things right, to train in order that we stay right. There are only two foundations for our thinking, man's word or God's word. And if you start with man's word, then then marriage and sexuality is whatever you want. And gender is just what we feel. And there are no, no moral absolutes. After all, man's word is based on, on corrupt opinions and it changes all the time, doesn't it? God's Word is an unchanging foundation of our thinking. God's Word is clear. Marriage is for one man and one woman. There's only male and female. And morality doesn't change based on our feelings or circumstances. Your foundation determines your beliefs. Matthew 7, 24. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and it beat against that house, and it fell, and great, and great was the fall of it. If you want the right beliefs, you must have the right foundation, God's Word. Framing members. The framing framing members are the the pieces that make the structure. They're the, the parts that make the walls that everything else attaches to. Each member is important. Each plays a significant role in the structure, in the design. When I'm building a house, it's, it's critically important that I, that I follow the architect's plans. I must put the framing members in the right locations. And I must make sure that I use the right framing member in those locations. See, there, there's headers, and there's, there's beams, and there's ledgers, and, and there's king studs, and, and jack studs, and, and trimmers. 
different sizes, 2 by 4, 2 by 6, 2 by 8, 2 by 10, 2 by 12. Different species, SPF, S, SIP, Doug Fir, Cedar, Oak, LVL, CDX, OSB. And I can't substitute one for another. I can't substitute one for another. can't say, well, I'm out of that one, so I'll just use this one. Or, well, that one's pretty heavy, so this one's a lot lighter. They each have a particular strength, particular purpose, particular place. The architect knows where they go. He knows their purposes. It's my responsibility to follow that. So what are the, the framing members when it comes to biblical sexuality? Matthew 9, 4, 19, 4, I'm sorry. Matthew 19, 4. Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? At the beginning the Creator made them male and female. God created humanity in His own image. Male and female. Since God's character includes both male and female attributes, we bear God's image in our sexual differentiation. Maleness and femaleness are not incidental to our nature. They are essential to our nature. Indeed, this tension between sameness and distinctness is actually a reflection of the Godhead reflection of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Spirit are the same, yet they're distinct. Each is fully and equally God, yet they are different. We are image bearers of the triune God, and that's precisely why, that's precisely why Sexual identity and roles have been such huge parts of the enemy's strategy. Satan wants to undermine and destroy those representations. And he has set out to deceive sinful humanity with his lies. Romans 1, 25-27 They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Now, worshiping the creation more than the creator does more than alienating, alienating mankind from God. It also distorts their heterosexual identity as they were created by God. Homosexual, transsexual, bisexual, pansexual, LGBTQ, all of this belief and its conduct gives evidence of the universal human rejection of of God's supreme glory and authority. And like all forms of sexual behavior that, value, that violate God's design, it is sin. It is sin. And it is dangerous. It is dangerous. That verse we just, that passage we, we just read says, and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Are the consequences for the sexual behavior? Absolutely. See, it's, it's dangerous for me as a builder to use a 2 by 4 instead of a 2 by 12 It's dangerous to, to let a 2 by 4 act like a 2 by 12 If you don't think that's true, build a floor with a 2 by 4 
Have somebody build the floor in your house with two-by-fours and walk on those. It's dangerous for everyone involved. A two-by-four can't be a two-by-twelve. It can't. Even if it wants to be, its desire does not change what it is. It is a two-by-four. To allow a 2 by 4 to be a 2 by 12 header over a window means it will fail. It will fall. They were not designed to carry that load. They don't have the, the right makeup. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with a 2 by 4 There's nothing wrong with a 2, two by 4 It's perfectly suited for certain things. But it is not a 2 by 12 no matter, no matter what anyone says or believes. Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Next, the finishes. Often when you're building a house, People that aren't familiar with it can have a hard time visualizing things. I know, I know Tanya has that difficulty sometimes. She'll come over to a job I'm working on and just two by fours. Often when it's just wall framing, people just can't imagine what it's going to look, on, look like. All they see are sticks of wood all over the place, Right? Two by fours and two by sixes and beams and, and plywood and doesn't seem to make much sense. That is until the drywall goes up. Then, then they begin to start to see it. It covers all those other things and, and it makes them all come together. Now I understand what that beam was for. Well, now I see where the kitchen is. Drywall puts skin on the bones, so to speak, right? Ephesians 5.31 quotes Genesis 2.24 and says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Marriage, marriage puts skin on the bones. But of what? What does it put skin on the bones of? The therefore in the verse we just read just tells us that it is a conclusion to another point. It's a conclusion to another point. If we go back and read it, Ephesians 5, that whole section, verse 32, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ, the church. Marriage is a picture of the covenant relationship of Christ and the church. A covenant commitment between Christ and the redeemed. A man and a woman must leave all others. And they must cleave to their mate a sacrificial commitment to the other. This commitment is at the heart of a covenant. It's a concept that is increasingly absent from our cultural framework. That's why the, the world wants to destroy the concept of biblical marriage. Well, you don't deserve Jesus. Well, he will just leave you if you disappoint him. Divorce has become acceptable. If your spouse or God doesn't make you happy or doesn't give you what you want, just leave. Find it somewhere else. Besides, we have no fault. Divorce, right? No fault. You don't even have to feel bad about it. It's no one's fault. Sometimes, eh, just happens. Life just 
gets in the way. We, we grew apart, right? We just grew apart. And then we try to recreate marriage according to man's image. Gay marriage. All right, God. No, uh-uh. We define it. We define marriage, not God. We're not in a covenant with God anymore. We want to be in a covenant with ourselves, with the world. The enemy. The enemy is very sneaky. Very crafty. One other quick point about the finishes, that is marriage. What dresses up the house to make it beautiful? The trim, the millwork, the doors, the bookcases, the the cabinets, the flooring, the paint, stuff like that, right? Makes it look beautiful. What is that? The Christian home, that includes everything that the world sees, in our marriage. Everything that the world sees in our marriage, our children, the way we treat our spouse, how we talk to them, how how we, we talk about them. Does our home reflect what we claim to believe? The quality of the trim work says a lot about the home builder. Shoddy craftsmanship makes the home look shoddy. It can cause people to question the builder. A dysfunctional home life reflects poorly on Christians, on the church, and most importantly on God. How does your marriage how does your marriage look like to the world? Are you Are you showing them something that they would desire to have? Because you have followed the plan? The building inspectors. Building inspectors play an important, crucial role in building. They check that everything is built properly. That you followed the architect's plans and and the building codes. They ensure for the structural safety of the building. That's their job. That's their responsibility. For them not to do this would be a dereliction of their duties. For them not to do this would be a dereliction of their duties. They were found not to be doing it. You would would have to question why. Why are you not doing your job? You would say, well, are they being bribed? Maybe they're being bribed. Or or maybe they're being paid off to look the other way. Maybe they're getting something something in exchange for not enforcing the laws and the the codes and the rules. Maybe there's, there's something that they're getting to not do it. Or... Or maybe you'll say, well, maybe they're just lazy. Maybe they're just lazy and they don't feel like doing their job. They just don't feel like doing it. They're just lazy. Either way, either way, they would rightly be removed from that position. They would be removed from that position. The jurisdiction that has authority would find someone else who will do it faithfully. Someone who isn't lazy. Someone who won't take bribes or payoffs. Now, I'll be honest, there's sometimes an awkward relationship between builders and inspectors. Some builders are honest and try to do a good job, and others are not, and they, they try to hide things, see what they can slip past them. And sure, and sure, sometimes there are inspectors that misuse that authority. But most, most, the, the good ones anyway, they try to help you build the best house that you can. 
See, they want you to succeed. A good building inspector wants you to succeed. They want to see scores of well-designed and well-built homes all over the area they work. Nothing makes them more proud than to look and see all of these beautiful, well-built homes. Go, yes, those homes are beautiful. They're strong. They're going to be around for a long, long time. It's what they want. But the way they do it, the way they do it is by making sure that everything is correct. And if it's not, they point it out. Not, they point it out. They issue an inspection report. The list of the violations. Here's one. Orange tag. Not approved. It's not red. That's good. Red means you're in big trouble. But it's not yellow. It's a little bit more than just caution. It's orange. It's not approved. Something's not right. You got to fix it. Maybe it'll be an undermined foundation, improper bracing, framing is wrong, flashing in, incomplete. And oftentimes it'll, it'll list the code, the specific code that you violated. 2015 MMC. 302-3.3, board holes no greater than 60% of width for non-bearing, no greater than 40% depth for bearing walls. It's for a four-inch dryer vent that went through some two-by-six studs. Got to report. Got to fix that. You can't, you can't continue. You can't move into the house. It's not right. They point out what is wrong, what you need to do to fix it. Christians, the church, have a responsibility to be, to be like that. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. To verify that people are building homes according to the architect's plan, according to to the code. Give a report of violations with the corrections required. So, so here is a list of violations, world. Homosexuality. Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Transgenderism. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Non-binary, Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Gender identity. 1 Corinthians 11, 14 through 16. Doesn't nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone is inclined to dispute this, 
We have no other practice, nor do the churches God. Nature itself shows it. Men go bald. Women don't, by and large. Men grow beards naturally. Most women don't. Cross-dressing. Deuteronomy 22.5 A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. For the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. Same-sex marriage. Genesis 2.24 For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And then a host of other sexual sins. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10 through 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor idol- adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. That's just a partial report. The violations against biblical sexual morality. Now, unfortunately, it's not an exhaustive list. But thankfully, it doesn't end there. Thankfully, it doesn't end there. Not in construction and not in God's Word. While the inspectors do bring a report listing all the violations, it doesn't stop there. They don't say, well, well, you tried, but, but you messed up. You didn't do it right. Oh, well, too bad. So sad. You're a horrible builder. Go home. It's all over. No. No, they give us that report. Ultimately... What we're after is this. Every builder is after one of these. It's a certificate of occupancy. C of O is what we call it. This says that we've, we've corrected all of those errors. All of those things from, from the report. We fixed them. We corrected it. We did it right. So we equip ourselves with biblical truth to confront the lies about sexuality and gender in our culture. It's important that we remember that God hasn't called us to be contentious. Defending the truth is not the same as defending our pride, picking fights, or being rude to others. On the contrary, as we stand firm in God's Word, it's important that we speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 tells us that. Our purpose is not to condemn people. Our purpose is not to condemn people, but to call people to God. He loves every person on this earth. And according to 2 Peter 3.9, He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed but wants everyone to repent. As believers, we have the opportunity. We have the privilege. More than that, we have the responsibility to share God's love with the world, including those who are lost, who are lost in our culture's sexual confusion. Like these inspectors give us opportunity to correct our mistakes, the Lord does the same. We must stand firmly on God's truth. We must proclaim it. We must defend it. We must. But we do it because we care for the souls of those who are astray. We know that they are in great danger 
Even if they don't, even if they don't recognize the danger that they are in, we do. We know there are structural problems. There are structural problems. A a catastrophic collapse is imminent. We want them to realize, we want them to recognize the error, the sin that they are in. We want them to repent and believe. Repent and believe. We want them to come to faith in Christ, to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. And then, and then they can enter true rest, joy, and safety in a home built according to the architect's plans, according to the code, God's truth. So as you defend the faith, remember to always love it, let it come from a place of love. For us not to intervene, for us not to intervene when we know the consequences reveals the incompetence, reveals the incompetence of Christians. In the church. It's like those building inspectors who turn a blind eye. Why? What are you getting out of it? Or are you just lazy? We're seeing a trend where sexual immorality is becoming more and more accepted. People no longer believe marriage is a lifetime commitment between one man and one woman, even in the church. And in recent years, it's become more acceptable to believe that gender is fluid. People can choose to be whatever gender they want. And in fact, to not celebrate these progressive ideals is increasingly viewed as antiquated, repressive, unloving and and harmful. Since the 1960s sexual revolution, culture has been pushing further away from God's design on marriage and sexuality. The problem is that once we start to deny God's design for sexuality and marriage, anything can be permissible. Anything can become permissible. Moral relativism is permeating our culture. Your truth is your truth. Sadly, even many Christians are are getting swept up in this thought. To be seen as loving, they've tried to to redefine sin or, or simply refuse to call it out in the culture. But no one, no one, including Christians, get to define what sin is. That's God's role. It's crucial that believers today be equipped to think biblically about marriage and sexuality. This starts with a a proper understanding of God's Word and then submitting to it. If God and His Word are the authority, then He sets the rules. We don't get to define marriage or sexuality, however we want. We don't get to define gender. God alone defines these concepts. So to answer to the massive, the answer to the massive confusion we see in our culture today is, is a clear understanding of God's design for sexuality. The architect clearly laid it out in his word. We must submit to his plan. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you again. And Father, we must confess that we have not always done well with standing true to your word. Father, some of us have 
have turned a blind eye to, to things in our culture, in our world, even in our own families, in our own homes, things that are counter to your design, your plan. Father, I pray that you would forgive us of that. Father, that we would repent, that we would believe the truth of your word and your design, that we would hold firmly on that design as our foundation, recognizing that you you know far more than any of us. Father, I pray that you would help us to, to be mindful of that. Be mindful of the the members that make up the home, male, female. Those finishes will reflect well on you. Father, I pray that we as a church, as Christians, would be faithful, faithful stewards of your truth. As we as we hold the world to that truth, as we hold others to that truth, not to condemn them, but them to call them to you so that they could know true peace, true joy, true safety. Father, again, we, we just pray that there would be an uprising in your church, a rebirth, people willing to be bold, Stand boldly, firmly on your truth. Father, that we would do it lovingly as we call them to repentance and faith. Father, we just pray that you would help us to do this for your glory. Amen. If you'll take your hymnals once again, we will close with page 526, The Solid Rock. It's on Christ, the solid rock that I stand. Will you stand with us as we close today? Let's do verse 4. The foundation 
to everything. Sexuality, family, everything is built on the solid rock foundation of God's Word. That should guide us in all that we do. Amen? Thank you for coming.